Okay, so with that, I'd like to officially welcome everybody to today's virtual presentation of Arizona Fireflies with Dr. Joe Cicero. Dr. Cicero has a Master's of Science from the University of Arizona, as well as a PhD in Entomology from the University of Florida in Gainesville. He has an expertise in insect faunistics, as well as the evolution of insects otogeny. And I'm sorry if I butcher some of these words, Dr. Cicero. Um, as well as the internal and external insect anatomy with secondary studies in botany and electron micro microscopy. Additionally, he has specializations in several insect groups, including bioluminescent, flightless, and wood boring species. Dr. Cicero has hiked the mountains and valleys of Southern Arizona and California for many years, identifying and characterizing the region's fireflies and glowworms. So we'd like to thank you all for being here today. And with that, I'll, talk, I'll turn it over to Dr. Joe Cicero. Go ahead, Mr. Dr. Joe. Do you see it? What do you see? The mountain. We got the PowerPoint up. There you go. How about that? Now, you're, now you're in uh, slideshow mode and you're ready to go. Oh, marvelous. Scared me for a while. Well, good morning. And I'm very appreciative of all this turnout and this interest in fireflies. It's just getting started as of last year. We've um, gotten. Um, Correspondence with the Xerces Society and with um, the New Mexico Biopark as um, institutions that are out trying to conserve these uh, these insects because they are actually they're endangered um, because of the uh, habitat destruction and modifications that you folks know about. But more of that later. I count 22 different species of fireflies in Arizona. Um, there are many more that are probably out there. In fact, we know very little about the ones up in uh, Northern Arizona. And because people won't send pictures, they just take photos on, of their flashes on YouTube and uh, the iNaturalist, but I haven't gotten any hard, hardcore um, pictures of them or specimens. We're working on that right now. Um, if parents wanna go see this kind of thing and show their kids this kind of thing, this is at Pina Blanca. All they need to do is get, get on my list serve down here at the bottom, ArizonaFireflies at gmail.com, and you'll get announcements as to when these things are starting to fly. And it's a perfectly good habitat. Pena Blanca has got a nice wide clear road uh, for kids to um, move up and down on with their nets and catch them and streak them on their arms and all of the other things that, that uh, we used to do when we were young back east. So, um, one of the reasons why I like fireflies so much is because there are so many aspects about them that have no known precedent in science. And I'll be telling you about some of those um, uh, as we proceed. First, let's start with the larvae. The larvae of fireflies, there they are. The larvae are very characteristic because they all have lights. Every one of them, as far as we know in the world, have lights like this. There's two dots right there, two light organs at the underside, of the second to last abdominal segment. Here they are right here, they're not on, but that's them. And um, they glow randomly and unpredictably on the ground. Whereas the fireflies use a rapid accretion and quick decay of their luminescence, the fire, these larvae will glow continuously for a while then shut it off and then glow again whenever they feel like it. That may have to do with swallowing or I don't know. Pulsatile motions, I don't have any idea, but we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, another characteristic besides the lights is the fact that the dorsal segments here are more or less trapezoidal and sometimes rectangular, but it's a very distinctive um, habit, habitus here for these, uh, for these fireflies. Most other beetles have, have other arrangements, but nothing like this. Uh, another characteristic of them, of them is this prehensile um, abdomen. The abdomen is too long, and it's, so instead of dragging it with their legs, they, they curl it under and, and then push it out like an inchworm, and they move along with it. The other characteristic of them is their retractable head. The head, it looks like it's gone, but it's not. It's retracted into the prothorax and it's hiding there probably because it um, has enemies. It has flies 
that parasitize it probably through that that uh, head opening. We don't know that yet either, but we do do know that fly pupae and fly maggots will come out of this after feeding on their internal um, internal uh, organs. Um, and it's also, I imagine, a, a way to prevent it from being bitten off by predators. They just they pull it back in very rapidly if they're disturbed. Still another aspect of the uh, firefly larva is this prehensile tail here. It's called a pygopodium and it's inflatable. We don't know if that's liquid or oxygen or air. We don't know, but it inflates out like a many fingered glove. And if you look carefully, you can see its muscles in there because that's, it uses the muscles to pull them back in when it's done with one of these ambulations here. So it, it curls the abdomen in and then it, it, it um, extrudes these fingers and they have hooks on them, as you can see, and plants the body down as it pushes it forward to assist with the legs. Um, and, and also as a hold fast because they feed ravenously on snails and they probably feed on um, earthworms too and whatever else they bump into soft body mollusks in, uh, in the soil. But the snails are their, apparently their primary um, food because they just, they hollow the whole thing out, clear down to the, uh, to the, the inner tip and uh, glean the surface and then they crawl under a rock to digest and to molt. And that I think is all I want to say about the um, larvae. This is one that we have here locally, the Southwest Spring Firefly. Is there a, a dog barking that can be turned off? Can that be muted? That yeah, Joe, I'm trying to find and mute it. Okay, um, the Southwest Spring Firefly is here local and you can see it at the Empire Cienega. If you get on my listserv, they're starting to fly right now, but I'm waiting for the optimum moment when I can hold a public viewing for them. Okay, let's move on. There are three kinds of fireflies in Arizona, and these are based on behavior. The first one, which we'll talk about, are the day flyers. These things have no lights, or when lights are present, they appear as tiny, tiny flecks on the underside of the abdominal tip. And they're no brighter than those radium uh, wristwatches, the notches that you used to wear uh, on the radium wristwatches. Um, so before they were taken out, before they were taken off the uh, market, of course. These things you'll see in your backyard, they're really quite common. They fly in straight lines. All you have to do is see some black thing moving in straight lines and catch a, a, a view of these red uh, uh, stripes here. And you've got a day flying firefly. You can chase it down and catch it in your hands. The second group we'll talk at greater length about is the flightless, those are the flightless females. It's called sexual dimorphism. And that simply means that the male and the female look considerably different. In this case, it's the female that looks quite a bit different from a typical beetle, but yet this is the male of this female. They're both in the same species. The third one uh, we'll talk about are the wing flasher. These are the fireflies of folklore and poetry. The ones that you're probably here, uh, here you've uh, chimed in to listen to. And there's two, this is the one at Empire Santa Gun. This is the one down at the Tumacucori uh, National Historical Park that we also will hold public viewings of. This is the one that synchronizes its flashes with, the male synchronizer flashes with each other. It's also the one that occurs down in Pina Blanca. So moving on, Let's talk about the day flyers. There's not too much to say. As you can see, the males and females both look alike, except for this one species that's right up here in the Catalinas, and its female is unknown. And it's very likely that it is also wingless, like the ones I showed you previously. But I don't think there's any question about that. I just, just haven't found her yet, because this thing flies during the day, and so they're not using lights. And um, the female is probably hiding in the grass somewhere. I just haven't found her yet. And I'm going to be working on that tonight, uh, th this year. Uh, this species was over at um, Sycamore Canyon before the, its uh, habitat got extirpated. Somebody took out all the young oaks in a, um, in a forest that was at the end of the old uh, driveway into the canyon. And this thing has since vanished. It has a, uh, it secretes a latex, as you can see, and that's probably 
like uh, milkweed, um, yes, like uh, monarch blood and being unpalatable to predators. The second group is my favorite. These are the ones with flightless females. And they use what we call a glow fine mating protocol. And you can learn a lot more about that at my website here. There's a tutorial to help you understand the complexity of these things and they're extremely complex. Um, so the glow fine protocol is where the males fly in the air and the females are down on the ground glowing and the males are searching for the glow. They don't flash, they glow continuously. So you might think it's just a reflection of the moon, but if you look up and see there is no moon, then you, it's probably one of these fireflies. So there's an animation coming up next. Here it is here. on what you're likely to see. As soon as the sun sets, the males get out and start flying. They have these big dragonfly-like eyes to find the female. There's one right there that just appeared. Here's another one. Here's another one. Male found that one. That male found that one. And that male found that one. And that's the glow find system. Let's take a closer look at that. The female comes out from underneath her rock, puts on her shoes and socks, looks to the left, looks to the right, and starts inchworming her way along like this. Now, her legs are moving all the time. I just didn't draw them in because it's too, uh, it's too hard to do that. And she inchworms out in, in order to find a clearing. She wants a clearing where she's most visible to the males. And that's why they're endangered because this clearing is usually the middle of a trail or the, on a dirt road out in the mountains and, they, and where they're very uh, li liable to get run over. She genuflects like this and turns her lights on and just holds them like that in, in uh, anticipation of a male coming down. And, and that's that story. Let's move on. Uh, so here's an array of these flightless females from all over the world. This is Japanese. This is the United States, Southeast Asia. This is the Amazon. This is um, Mexico. And on we go. Um, this one's from Chile, Portugal, and so forth. But they all have this, this strange look to them. They're big and fat. That's because they undergo supernumeration, which means the male may undergo five uh, molts. The female will go to six, seven, eight. We don't know yet, but uh, they, they continue on growing larger and larger before they pupate. And the male doesn't care what she looks like as long as she shows those pretty lights. Um, that maybe is just not a problem with them. Um, okay, but more importantly, as you can see, some of these things look like, some of these females look like they're males. Some of them look like they're larvae and everything else falls in between. So we were talking about ontogeny. This is an ontogeny array here. There's, there's adult females. These are all post pupil and they all lay eggs, just like any other insect. And yet this one looks the most like it's larva. This one looks like it's larva a lot too with these undifferentiated segments. The cuticles and this one is transparent and the color you're seeing is, is um, adipose. It's fat body cells inside the anatomy, inside the exoskeleton, the transparent exoskeleton. Okay, so anyway, this looks the most like the larva. This looks more like a pupa here. The wings are, are there, but they're very, very short. This one looks a lot like the, the adult male. This one has taken on his pupation, in other words, some of these things are looking more and more like their adult males and others are looking more like their uh, larvae. So there's another group altogether called the true glowworms. All members of the family look like their larvae. Here's the male down here mating with this big supernumerated female who will then lay eggs and the eggs will hatch to these larvae. These are the glowworms. They're here local. You'll see them up in Catalinas, up in Santa Rita's, if you know where to look and how to look. And um, some of them are very large and some of them are very, very tiny. They feed ravenously on millipedes. They'll chop the head off and then start hollowing out the segments as they pass through it and emerge out the anal end. 
this thing will be totally evacuated. Like you can already see, it's even eating everything right up to the exoskeleton. You can see by that clear area there. If you're out in the wild and you see a pile of, of, of short segments of a dead millipede, then that's probably a, a, one of these glowworms that got to it before you did. This incredible thing here is up in Madera Canyon and it's female is this one here, Paul Merrick found it. He was here at the University of Arizona. And uh, let's turn it on. Yeah, hello? Yeah, Joe, sorry to interrupt you. There we go. I was gonna say, we were. some people were having trouble um, seeing your cursor, but now we've got it on the oh. screen here. So yeah, just- Oh, that's you know. my pointer. We should have checked that. Yeah, we okay, got it. Okay, so it's working now. I didn't know about that. Sorry. Yeah there, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay, let's turn this thing on. This thing, um, in, after a heavy rain, the rains will wash it out of its burrow and it will walk around like this until you poke it and then it lights up like you just saw. And that's an anti-predator tactic. They're really quite gorgeous. See the inchworm action and it's, it's doing the same thing that the firefly larvae do. But this is another taxonomic family called the glowworms. This one is incredible also, this is down in Mexico. And it has a, an extended head, watch right there. You can see there's a big protrusion out of its head like a camper's lantern that it's using, I guess it's rastering back and forth as a, as to scare things away that might be in their uh, path because they're almost blind. They just have simple eyes, their eyes aren't compound. But here you'll see these dorsal lights, all the ones in the prior, uh, uh, in, in Glowworms that we've known have rings all around the body. This one just has those dorsal lights like that, which tells me that we're for some big surprises as we start exploring the uh, American tropics at night for these kinds of insects. Why did that stop? I'm frozen. Um, why am I frozen? I lost my cursor. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear I, you. I don't know what happened. Um, oh, there's yeah. my cursor up there, but it doesn't come down. I've got, I've got to get it down to the bottom. My cursor is now on my taskbar on where, where it says mute, stop video, participant 37, chat. But the computer, it's, it's not coming down for me. I don't know. I've tried my... I've tried my uh, keyboard, that's not working. I'm frozen. Looks like I've got to um, stop the video and restart it. Is that gonna work? Um, I can see. The progress wheel, right? Yeah, maybe uh, someone's suggesting maybe try hitting your escape key. Yeah, I tried that myself. Why, it seems to have crashed. And you're saying your your left and right or up and down keys are they right. being, are they responsive? Uh, no, I get no response from my keyboard. This is a total crash. We're going to have to. I don't think I can even shut it off because I can't. Uh, I may have to control alt delete it. Okay. Well, I can. Uh... I'm going to go ahead and task manager myself and um, find it. Here it is here. Thanks to everybody for your patience in this real time uh, <laughs> technological issue. Looking for where it says end task. It should be in somewhere. I don't have any control over my screen. My end task. It should say end task here somewhere. And it doesn't look like it's what? giving you. Okay, can you can you click on? I think you have to click on a task that you want to stop. That'll happen next. So. 
it's not like it's not um being selected i can go like that yeah there, oh, there you it go. is there you go well that was fun <laughs> and then relaunch and uh we can just pick up where we left off and chug right along everybody got to see a behind the scenes <laughs> how the sausage is made Okay, here are the glowworms, and here this here's this incredible um, female that has has a um, scare tactic. It lights its whole body up if you poke at it like that. And then there's the one in Mexico. To get a second look at. Okay, we can move on. Now, like I was telling you, these things look like a gradient of, of life cycle. In other words, maturation from larva through pupa to adult. So one, one I did towards figuring these things out is to put them in order. Let's put them in order according to decreasing appearance similarity to the males. In other words, as we go from left to right, the look less and less like they're male. Well, if they're looking less and less like they're male, then they must be looking more and more like something else. And as, as you may um, follow, they're actually looking more and more like they're larvae. So this is metamorphosis in reverse. The larvae here, the one that's most larval, as you perceive this way, they get more and more mature until finally wings show up and you see differentiate differentiation of the thorax starting here and there's again more differentiation more differentiation now color has settled in more color more color is looking more and more like the males this one looks a lot like like her male this one looks even more like her male until finally we attain the end of the metamorphic program characteristic of most beetles. So if it's an ontogeny thing, then we need to learn a few things about insect life cycles. Um, I'm missing a slide. Oh, well. Back in 1946, Henry Hinton uh, called attention to hidden phases in metamorphosis. This is a classical life cycle of a pupating insect where you've got an egg that hatches to a first instar, then molts to a second and then to a third and then to the fourth and then to the fifth, which then becomes the pupa, which then uh, becomes the adult and the adult flies away. But if you look here, you can see wings, you can see legs, you can see compound eyes. The abdomen has compacted to, mo mostly it has some finishing touches to uh, pass through before it makes the adult, but it looks to me like metamorphosis is already over with. In other words, metamorphosis does not occur in the pupa, like the, the old saying that the, the caterpillar transforms into the butterfly during the pupal stage. That's not true. It's another stage, and that stage is hidden. And this is what Henry Hidden Hinton pointed out. It's called ferrate, and ferrate is Greek or Latin for hidden. But each one of these instars has a hidden stage where molting occurs. And if you don't follow that, then just think of a snake. Snakes and insects have the same problem. They both outgrow their skin and have to shed it periodically in order, uh, shed it periodically in order to, um, uh, in, to uh, secrete a new, new cuticle. So they, they, the epidermal cells break away from the old cuticle to leave space for the new cuticle to be laid down. Then they rupture that old cuticle and shed it, and the new cuticle takes on its, its color and its um, hardness. Up here, you can see this one. Do you have my, um, um, do you have my pointer? Can you see what I'm pointing right now? Yeah, we got you. You're up on the, uh, the small one up, up top, the end oba. 
Yeah, okay, what about now? Do you see that? Yeah, we got you. Oh, you've got it on both, good. You can see the color there in this pupa. It's not a pupa, it's a ferrate adult. It's a hidden adult. The pupal skin is encasing the adult that's inside it, and that adult hasn't ruptured the pupal skin yet. That's what's going on here. Eventually, when it's done with this finishing touches here, it will rupture the, the, the skin and proceed to the uh, tenoral, what we call the tenoral adult, and that's where it finishes the coloration fi and finishes the hardening up of the, of the uh, cuticle and then moves on to the adult. All that is finishing touches. This is the most important one right here, the ferrate pupa, because the larva enter into a molt, but instead of duplicating themselves like these other ones do, instead, this is where the wings grow out, the legs grow out, the compound eyes form, the abdomen contracts, and many, many other characteristics on its way to being an adult. So it's the ferrate pupa that we need to understand. This is where metamorphosis occurs not during the pupil stage. Pupil stage, most metamorphosis is already over with. A little bit more is, needs to be done during these final touch-ups. So we need to stretch this thing out and give us lots of leg room like this so that we can, we can uh, explain this further. The legs grow out, the wings grow out during this continuum here while they're still inside the old larval skin the eyes start forming and, and so on and so forth. So if we take all of these guys and lay them out here, it should be clear to you that indeed these things are metamorphic intermediates. In other words, they're not off in adventures in dimorphism independently of each other. They're all tapping into the primitive metamorphic program that all of them have. These are all adult females Post pupil, they're all, uh, they mate in legs like everything else. Now, these adults should be to the far right where the adult stage is, but since very little happens between here and there, we can go ahead and lay them out like this because a larva achieving 10 units, 10 arbitrary units of maturation will produce a female like this. A larva that quits early let's say at nine, it'll produce one like this, a little younger, a little uh, less mature than, than um, this one. If a larva finishes over here somewhere, this is what, what the female will look like when she passes through the finishing stages and onto the adult. I've got some models here to show you that explain that further. Let's watch the male. Here are your arbitrary levels of maturation. Let's watch the male first. It starts getting its wings. They get longer and longer. The abdomen compacts. It moves to the pupa where nothing happens. Then to the ferrate adult where it picks up its color and it moves off to the formal adult, which flies around flashing. The male, the female answers and they mate. Now let's look at the female. The female proceeds in the same way the male does, but as it's growing its wings, the endocrine system tells it to hit the brakes and skip the rest of the program and move directly to the pupa, ready or not. It picks up some color, goes to the adult, and the female is ready to receive a male that happens to fly overhead. So here's another one, another model here. Here's the male here. <coughs> The male proceeds clear through to the end of the program characteristic of that species. <clears throat> These are the characters it picks up as the larva passes through metamorphosis. First thing you'll notice is that some characters start early, finish early, and wait around for the rest of the body. Other characters, like the wings, start late and finish up at the end of the program, and other characters fall somewhere in between. Understanding that, will help people understand why these females look the way they do. So let's take this one right here, for instance. When the endocrine system tells them to hit the brakes, it's mesodorsum will have just gotten started. This character will have gotten most of it done, but there'll be a little left over. It'll still be less than mature. This one starts here. It's cut off here. 
Sorry, yes. sorry, Dr. Uh, I'm, 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 I think your cursor may be on the other monitor because again, we're there. We go. So yeah, whatever you're doing on no, bring it back. You, oh, you just told me that they were on both. It was when I told you, but yeah, whatever, whatever uh, screen you're on right now is the one that is best. Okay, then I better stare at this. Okay, so I, I was saying that these are the various characters that the male or that the larva passes through as it metamorphoses to the adult. The male is here because its larva achieved all 10 units of maturation and went to the pupa and on we go. The female, on the other hand, can, can be arrested at any period here. Uh, it's because it's the endocrine system that's controlling its metamorphosis. The, the example I've chosen is this one here that was arrested at six arbitrary units of maturation and then skips the rest of these and moves on to the pupa and then to the adult, ready or not. These characters are all staggered out. Some start early, some finish early, and wait around for the rest of the body. So with regard to this one here, all of the, all of the um, females will have this character completed. Whereas over here, all of these uh, females won't show any wings because the wings haven't started yet when the endocrine system arrested it and so on for all of the others. So let's have a look at this. Here's the fem there's the female pupa right there. This is where the endocrine system said hit the brakes. She then skips the rest of those stages and moves on to the adult ready or not. So as you can see in this condition, this, this character here just barely got started this character had a lot of running room, but didn't finish, and so on and so forth. This one is fully adult because it stopped, it finished very early in this in the scheme. There. Okay, so here are some Arizona species with flightless females. You can see these right out in our mountains. All you have to do is drive around at night with your headlights off. That's what I do. And uh, just be careful and you'll see a, what looks like a little spark in the grass. You can stop, look around for snakes or things you might trip over and don't disturb it because all you need to do is touch the, the, uh, the grass or the branches. It's something to disturb, it'll shut its light off and, and give up. Then you can back away and it'll start up again. Unless it's too disturbed, it'll turn around and crawl back under its rock. But importantly, these females crawl off from under the rock, as I um, illustrated earlier, and find an open area that's best for the males to see her. Now, this species doesn't do too well when it genuflects uh, because she doesn't know this, but her body is blocking most of her lights. This one is very cute. Look what it did. It, it um, climbed up to this pine needle and, and turned its lights on there. This one, however, doesn't know that the rock that it's standing on is blocking its lights too. Oh, well, the males will probably find, find it depending on how many are out there searching. This is the smartest one of all. Instead of genuflecting, this one twists its, um, its abdomen. It can twist it a little more too so that the body isn't in the way. And then it wiggles it back and forth for the male to drop down and mate with her. This is, this is her male here. This is right out here in our desert. If you drive, let's say, um, oh, I don't know, um, um, out in the Tucson mountains at night, some of those roads out there, uh, you should be able to see one of these sparks. You especially look in um, uh, uh, draws, canyon washes. And the, the whole trick of finding these things is yardage. The more you drive, the, the greater your chances of, of passing by one because they're all over the place throughout the desert floor and up into the mountains. You just have to find one that's right next to the road in, in, in your view. These are extremely fragile and vulnerable to traffic on dirt roads and trails, as I've said. You see the species dispersals in the hands of the uh, ambulating larvae. The field doesn't do anything more than come out here, advertise and go back in again. So it's the larva that found this location for her and pupated at that point. She will then lay eggs there. She's not going anywhere. And it's up to the larvae to 
disperse in, in other areas and find new places for, for the next generation. This is a real interesting one. You can see this one up in Sabino Canyon. I'm sure all of you have walked Sabino Canyon Road at night. Um, if you're in the monsoon season, you'll see tarantulas and snakes and so on and so forth. But this thing is out there glowing as well. It's as I explained before, you'll see it walking, ambulating inchworm style and randomly and unpredictably turning its lights on and off. This is its female. And here she is with her lights on, trying to uh, attract a male. She doesn't have very good lights. And the reason why I think is because she's using pheromones. She's using pheromones and the males you can see is certainly equipped to sense um, pheromones. My belief is that, is that the, the female releases the pheromones and that brings the male close enough to her to see the light and move further to mount and mate. So it looks to me like a, a um, twofold uh, approach system. I don't have any proof of that yet. It's so hard to do bioassays on these things. The best we can do is hope to even find one in the first place. Uh, this is the male that has a pair of larval lights like there. This, this larval lights pass through metamorphosis, and, but they're not used to have no function that we know of. It's just they metamorphosed incompletely like the body of this thing did. This is actually, it, uh, doesn't finish either, but I haven't talked about that yet. This is essentially the end of the program and we can't go any further without getting too complicated. So I won't be doing that. Instead, let's move on to the third group, the one you've been waiting for. This is the firefly of folklore and poetry. And we have two species, the Southwest firefly, Southwest spring firefly. This is its genus, Bicelonica. And you will see it at the Empire Cienega. If you get on my listserv, I'll um, send out a uh, alert as to when it's best to see them and hold public feelings as well. They're flying right now, in fact, but it's very hot and dry. And we need another dash of rain for the population to pick up. This is the female. The male has these bright lights. The female doesn't need those. Those are reflections there from the flash. But this is the light of the female here. And she has a pair of those larval lights I, I pointed out earlier also. And these will blink back at the male if, if she sees the male. We'll talk more about that later. Here's the uh, other species. That's the Southwest synchronous firefly, the genus Photurus. You can view that at Pina Blanca and at Tumacacore National Historic Park. If you get on my listserv. <coughs> Here's the Big Dipper firefly. It's one of the ones that used to be up here in the Salt River before we plopped Phoenix on top of it. And it's apparently extirpated. We haven't found it. It, it could be out there. There's a lot of unknown country out there but we just haven't found it yet. This one is in New Mexico, and we think it might be able to get into Arizona eventually and show up in the Chiricahuas. We don't know yet. But Northern Arizona is a big question mark. We just don't know how many species up there. We know there's two genera, but there's many, many other mysteries. So the Southwest spring firefly, is uh, a member of a genus, I'm, excuse me, I'm starting to get tried. Excuse me. Okay, I didn't prepare myself with any water but I sure needed it. Um, okay, so the Southwest spring firefly is a member of a genus that's very common down in the tropics. In fact, there's 65 nomina of that, of that genus south of the border. This one species managed to make its way up and poke its foothold into the Huachuca Mountains. We don't know how long ago, But they moved over to this uh, and Barcian again, they're over at um, Muleshoe also. <laughs> and somehow they got up into Northern Arizona and subspecified. So this is that one. There's the type um, labels right there, whole type labels. And here's this, 
subspecies is up in uh, northern Arizona. It's in Morency, Fossil Creek, Chemin Spring, even in New Mexico, that was recently discovered. The difference between the two is that these wings are all black, whereas the nominate subspecies has those stripes. So the identifying features of this, if you ever see a firefly and catch it, <coughs> they're the only known bisloth in the United States. Generic characters separated from other fl flashy fireflies. And there are no others that have the black wing covers like that. So the case is closed there. If you see one with black wings like this one, it's a day flyer. And I, I pointed that one out to you earlier, but there's no other firefly around that has these, this black color on their wings. So if you're out there in the Huachucas, Car Canyon, Miller Canyon, Ramsey, or, no, you can't get into Ramsey at night. There's ash also. Around the backside, that would be uh, Scotia Canyon. You'll see these fireflies. In fact, we saw them last weekend. Really quite nice. So now let's talk about flash answer routines because that spring firefly uses the flash answer routine. This is where males fly through the air emitting a phrase of flashes characteristic of their species. This one here, this is from back east, of course, because there's so many species back there. This one does the S in Morse code. This one does, what is that? That's the, um, I'm trying to remember. I don't know, I don't remember anymore. It's the dit, oh, that's the E in Morse code. This one um, blinks many at a time. This one does these swirls. This is the Big Dipper firefly I was telling you about that we thought was in, in uh, Arizona up by the Salt River and apparently got extirpated with, with uh, man's disturbance. But it does this J up the axis of a plant, hoping that a female is sitting on the axis and will blink back at him. So the flash answer routine involves the male flashing and the female down here in the grass looking up. Now the females are very coy and very, very shy. You gotta wonder about them because <clears throat> the males are trying very, very hard to, to, uh, to find them. If, if a male passes overhead and if she sees him, she will identify him on the basis of the flash pattern he is emitting. If she likes that, and if she feels like it when she's done yawning, she will blink back at him. <clears throat> Now that blink occurs at a characteristic delay after the last flash of his. So this, let's say this is the first, second, third. When he flashes that flash, she will black, if she wants him, she will blink back at him after a characteristic delay, whether it's one second, one and a half seconds or whatever fraction thereof. That is the means by which the male identifies the female as one of his species, instead of some miscellaneous flashes that may be occurring in the grass also. And it's also distinguished her from any other species that may be around in the same habitat, that would be sympatric. So that's what we call the flash answer routine. And the bisalonica, this thing here, does that flash answer routine. The males flash, they do a swerve. I think there's one that looks like it. this kind of swerve here. And if the female sees him and if the female likes him, he will, she will flash back and he will drop down to mate with her. However, it's got a, um, a um, modification of the typical flashes of fireflies because this starts out before the sun sets. It's actually flying around when it can still see the females directly and if it flies real low to the ground, and, and if it passes over a female, he'll, he'll just jump on her without any flash communication. Then as the sun sets, they do something very clever. They increase their altitude for a more panoramic view. The cone of their vision is, it's, is much larger, so if they're able to cover more area as they flash. And then what happens right about now is everybody, all the males just fall out of the um, fall out of the sky and stop flashing, except for a few hardcore macho males that will continue flying 
into the night looking, looking for females. They must be horny or something. That may be what's happening. They may be too old and are just desperately trying to find the last chance of, of finding a female. But importantly, they increase their altitude clear up here in order to cover a very wide cone of vision, a, a more panoramic view to increase their chances of passing over a female. And you can see this at the Empire Cienega if you join us during our um, public viewings. Let's proceed now to the Southwest Synchronous Firefly. This is the most interesting one I've ever seen because it does it gathers into a, a congregation and the birders among you, and I imagine there are many, it, uh, will know that what a lek is. This is a, they, they congregate into a lek, a very tight um, arena where males compete with each other for the female fancy. And they synchronize their flashes, both in air and on the ground. And um, you've got to see this kind of thing. We're hoping it'll happen again this year. This is, of course, at um, Pena, this would be at Pena Blanca and at the Tuma Kokori uh, National, National Historical Park. This one here is out by Amato, but it's all on private property. So here's what they do. When they're in the arena, most of the time, the all males have got their lights off and the arena is in a state of blackout, completely dark. And the males are hovering around or running around in there trying to find females on their own. And then every once in a while, the female get the, the male gets horny. The male gets horny and starts flashing. And starts flashing to ask the question, am I where the action is? Is there anybody else around? He this I call it the initiator. He will initiate and entrainment from other males that may happen to be in visual range with him. So he flashes a triplet. This one flashes immediately afterwards, then this one, then this one, then this one. And it races around the arena looking like a miniature lightning bolt. But it's not done then, because what happens there, by the time that one's done, the, uh, the initiator flashes another triplet. And this time, all participants phase shift backwards in an attempt to achieve synchrony with him. They don't quite make it, but they get pretty close because the, the triples are all overlapping. And in, in, in fact, you'll see, the, uh, you'll see three trains. The first train will be the first flash of the triplet. The second train will be the second flash of the triplet. And the third train will be the third flash of the triplet. So to start over again, the scene would look like this from out of nowhere, from out of a blackout, you'll see this domino effect where uh, a lightning bolt will zip around, blink, 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 triplets, one after another after another, until one male ends because there was no, no other male that happened to be in visual range. Then it flashes another triplet and they all face shift so that what you'll see is three lightning bolts, zip, zip, zip. And that, it, that involves the first flash to the second flash and the third flash, very near synchrony. The third, they'll do it again. Let's see, yeah, they do it again. They try to phase shift a second time. And on the third time, they do achieve synchrony where the first one and the last one are in synchrony with each other. So therefore all the other ones in the, entra in the tra entrainment are also in synchrony. So the whole place will go blink, blink, blink. Blink, 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 blink. The lightning bolts won't be moving. Instead, all of them will stay in the same place. So this is the upperly projected lek boundary. This is the altitude that patrolling males are flying in hopes of seeing a female or in hopes of seeing where all this action down there where they're more likely to find a female than on their own. And when a patroller comes in, it will either just join or just fly on by, or it will survey the arena. And when it does that, it, it takes its, its flashes and streaks them around like that to excite everybody. And then it stops and hovers and the entire arena lights up and because all of them can see him from, that, from, their, uh, from his panoramic view. So the entire arena blinks in synchrony. 
And you've got to see this. I don't know how else to describe it until we can get some videos of this. You'll see the whole thing go blink, 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 blink. And then they all die out and uh, a, a blackout resumes. This one here was fabulous. I just, I was amazed by this one because it was one long streak like this that set all the fireflies off. Then it, what happens is, is they hover up here waiting to decide what to do. And then it'll zigzag down and land in an area where no flashes were seen. In other words, an area of darkness. The reason why they're doing that is because that's the best area to look for females because all the, they don't want to land near another male because the male doesn't know where a female is. If the male knew where a female was, then he would not be participating with synchrony. He'd be out chasing her down. So everything depends on moving in the direction of darkness. And that's what you see here. When these guys are done in training, they'll move in the direction of darkness where females are more likely to occur. They're not going to move towards each other because that's that's ridiculous. They, um, there's no females there because if there if they if there was, then the, these males wouldn't be participating in this male-male uh, -male transaction. We call this reciprocal altruism, and you, the biologists among you, should know what that means. It's males uh, exchanging information and getting at minimum parity of information uh, uh, of opportunity to compete complete. That's more, uh, I don't want to get any further into that. It's just too complicated. These behaviors um, are just way too complicated. Okay, so fireflies have a very serious problem, um, as do all other insects and, and animals as well, other animals. Drought is one that kicked them way back. That would be during um, La Nina. Hydrological modifications are just destructive to the, um, to the aquatic life, which includes them. They're after the snails that are in the um, moist soil that is, is, is um, supplied by the streams, whether they're, um, whether they're uh, ephemeral or not. This, the snails are still underground and the larvae, if it's not too hot, too dry, they'll be migrating around the soil looking for them. These things, these eco-terrorist things go up and down trashing um, uh, desert ephemeral streams, as you know, uh, they're, they're no good for anything, including the fish and all the other uh, animals, especially the estivators underneath these rocks. So specialized predation is an interesting one too. Other fireflies are carn carnivorous or cannibalistic, you see? This is back east. This firefly sits on the ground waiting for one of these prey species to fly overhead. She will then mimic the female of this male. The male drops down seeking a wife, and instead she grabs him and eats him. These are all the flash answer routine uh, prey species. But if this thing ever got into Southern Arizona and found these leks, it would be a, a field day for it. Uh, Lucky would come to an end because all of the uh, males in the lek would be sitting ducks. That hasn't happened yet. But as I told you earlier, there's th that firefly from New Mexico is in this genus. We just don't know enough about it. If it does take to eating other fireflies, well, we're out of luck. Light pollution, you know, that affects everything. Uh, uh, fireflies are especially vulnerable to that. And so the night flying moths and so forth, because it interferes with their um, navigation and their, their uh, sex location and so on. There's Fragmentized riparian. This is up at the uh, Empire Cienega. There's, I need a better picture, but a fire eruptured here and knocked out a, a long section of that riparian uh, cottonwood bylane. And but there's other uh, other uh, rivers and streams that you, I'm sure you know about. Like down, if you drive towards Nogales on I-19 and and try to follow the Santa Cruz River, you'll see big gaps in the riparian corridors. And that's has a very, very bad toll on the fireflies as well as other animals. Snag removal is a big problem. I think, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the, years ago, the Forestry Service sold the permits for uh, locals to pick these things up, throw them in their pickup truck and use them for firewood. Well, the problem is that there's all kinds of life living underneath them, including the firefly and glowworm larvae, not to mention snakes nematodes and everything in between. 
And when you take these things out, it cripples the biodiversity in that area. And I think that's all I have for you, uh, Doug. Uh, yeah, it is. Okay, how, how long was that? Was that an hour or 40 yeah. minutes? And yeah, that was that was perfect time. Um, and we've actually got oh, a few. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you did it great, Good. thank you. And we've Good. actually got Good. a couple of questions from the chat. Um, our first one comes from Julia Schlossberg. And Julius was wondering, in the wild, do you see females with widely varying morphology or is it not detectable to the eye? Hi, Julius. The females, both the, um, the flightless females and the flying flashing females um, can't be distinguished, uh, have no radical differences between each other within the same species. However, these flightless ones, um, are the, they gain their morphology by quitting metamorphosis early. So let's say one individual quits his metamorphosis ex at exactly three units of maturation. Another one, a brother or sister, uh, no, I don't mean brother, I mean a sister, might quit at 3.1. Another one might quit at 2. Point now. So the differences between them are that one is more or less mature than the other, even though they're all adult females. And it's just, a, uh, it's a different way of studying these insects and uh, understanding their morphology. And that is, I think I'm the only one doing this because everybody's preoccupied with cladistics and uh, molecular phylogenetics. But ontogeny and phylogeny is a very, very old, old science that lost its way. Stephen Jay Gould wrote an excellent book on ontogeny and phylogeny, but it just it's, it hasn't gained any popularity in the uh, in academia, even though it's it's uh, a major factor in evolution. We'll see you later on this month, hopefully, Julius. Okay, what's next? Let's see. We have another question from Jillian, and Jillian asks, "Are the glowworms and a, forgive me if I butcher this, fin Joe today?" Ph. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, thank you. The, the term glowworm was vetted for these fingodids, for the ones that look that are banded. Um, and but that's just a common name, and people can use common names indiscriminately if they want. And so the larva of the firefly, as it glows, you can call that a glowworm too, if you want. Um, there's earthworms that glow, you can call those glowworms. But those are just common names. Technically, the uh, glowworms are the term glowworm is assigned to to the thin codids. That second family I showed you. Wonderful. Um, and actually, I had a question, um, and this may be a little bit more basic than the others. I apologize, but um, the flash answer routines is that a learned behavior? Or is that instinctual? No, it's instinctual, and we don't use that term anymore. The, the term instinct was thrown out a long time ago because we have better terms for that. Um, we, it's just, instinct was a catch-all thing for what you're talking about when we didn't understand the complexity or even how to approach the complexity of these behaviors, and we do now. Um, and there's bioassays, that we, there's no learning at all. There is modification. The males will modify their, uh, their search strategy based on how heavy the competition is. And I find that extremely interesting, but it's, it's hard to um, characterize that because it's only happening for that one season or that one point in the density of, of the population. If the density decreases, you won't see it. So there is some facultativeness to their behavior. And um, you, it takes years and years to notice that. So what you see on any given year isn't the default behavior, the non-facultative behavior that the thing is stuck with. It does have some uh, variations that are facultative and it has oddball, um, oddball males that just do things differently. It's always a bell-shaped curve rather than a, uh, a uniform uh, behavioral protocol. So I hope that that should answer what you were asking. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so that's all of our written questions. And now if anyone has a question that they would like to ask themselves, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask that question. All right. <laughs> I don't hear any takers. So I think we have all of our questions answered. So 
with that, um, again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Cicero. This was a great, great presentation, and we really appreciate you being here and doing this for us. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Um, a lot of you are members. A lot of you have even donated to be here and really appreciate that. Um, just want to remind everyone that a full uh, this video will be made available on our YouTube channel, and I will email that link out to everyone because I have everybody's email that signed up. So um, it takes a little bit to get that uploaded, but once that's uploaded, we'll have that up on our YouTube channel. That way, in case anybody had to leave a little earlier, maybe got here a little bit late, they'll be able to, to check it all out. Um, so basically, so that's all we've got today. Um, and again, once lastly, we'll end by thanking Dr. Cicero and thanking all of you to be here. Um, so if that's all and we've well, got. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Cicero. We appreciate it. Oh, hi, Jillian. I didn't see you there. Hello, Joe. Oh. Yeah. I'm, so glad, I'm so glad I caught your talk. It was an excellent talk. Oh, thank you. You should get interested in fireflies. Jillian. I, it, I am. I can't wait to see the ones down at Tim McCockery. I missed them last year. I didn't realize that they oh. were doing Well, we didn't know there. that. Yeah, that was the first year that, that we even knew. Tony Palmer down there knew, but he, he didn't broadcast it. Now, uh, I heard about that last year, and there's thousands of them. I, oh. I hope that we get a monsoon this year. I'm I'm like dying for a monsoon this year because I'm waiting for some bolus spiders to mature and some other things. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I like those bolus spiders too. I've seen those in Florida. They're so interesting. Yeah, I found oh, an area your... with uh, yes. like 50 egg sacs over the winter. So it's like I know that there should be some this year if we get the monsoons. It's a big if though. So well, we should get them. I don't see why not. They may be um, attenuated, but uh, they always come one way or another. Well, three years ago, they basically didn't. We only got one inch during the whole summer like, three years ago. I see. That was really disastrous. So hopefully it won't do a repeat of that. What we need are incantations and yeah. rubbing. <laughs> or sacrifice a few. Yes, some sacrificials. <laughs> I can I can suggest a few of that. What? No, you know, donkeys or what? What? Are, whatever. Let's not get to <laughs> We won't go but, there. Um, <laughs> but that's what the Indians used to do. They did, or the natives used to do sacrificials. I don't know if it worked or not. But, okay. Yeah, we could always try it. You know, do an experiment. Yeah, we'll talk about that more because I do remember I was in some uh, seminars talking about what the Indians, Indians used to do to. Um, Incite range. Oh boy, I don't want to talk about it now. Okay. Okay, I think we're done. Um, okay. I think we're done. You guys are welcome to come. Uh, you, I get. I'll give you. I'll give my list serve list uh, list announcements on the progress of them. That is uh, optimum times for for their uh, to see their flashing. Now the moon is always a big problem. Um. Except for the day flying one, it should come out during the day and then see the moon and then go back in again. But at least it will be, you'll be able to see it running around looking directly for the females, like the, the flat, like the uh, day flyers do. And um, okay, I think we're good to go. We're Excellent. good to go. Right before we sign off, I just want to let everybody know that I put the Arizona Fireflies at gmail.com listserv into the chat. So if anybody wants to copy and paste it, they can go ahead and find that right there. Okay, let's close out. Excellent. Adios, muchachos. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for everybody for being here. We appreciate it so much. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.